uh, turn the time over to our instructor. With us this morning is Katie Wagner with Utah State University Extension. Uh, the class is fruit tree pruning. Uh, we're grateful to have Katie with us this morning to teach the class. Um, we thought we'd get the fruit tree pruning class um, on the schedule early this year uh, because right around the corner is the best time to be uh, pruning fruit trees. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn the time over to Katie. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can share my screen here and just make sure that everything looks okay. So give me just one second and I'll get it into presenter mode. And how is that looking? That's uh, looking good for me. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I'm sorry we can't be in person. This time of year is a little bit iffy. <laughs> Sometimes it's just uh, crazy cold. Sometimes there's snow up for our waist. Uh, sometimes we have you know horrendous air pollution levels and, and most of us can't breathe. I'm certainly in that category. So um, this was uh, probably the, the best option for today. Um, given that we just don't, didn't have our crystal balls out and able to know exactly what we were up against. Um, but I'm really glad everybody can be here. And I'm hoping that I can provide a little bit of kind of introductory pruning information for you to get you started um, or to clarify a few things for you. Um, and then uh, I also, of course, will want to point out some great resources that are available that uh, you can go back and you can visit and revisit so that you can strengthen your pruning knowledge over time. Um, interestingly, pruning is not really my forte. It wasn't really my background. Um, maybe I share this with some of our participants today that I was really intimidated by it initially. Um, and I can tell you, because this is how it went down for me, is the more you kind of delve into this, the more you go back and kind of revisit this information, the more you kind of figure out what you're doing and why you're doing, it does get easier. And, um, and over time, you will become a pruning guru, I promise you. So hopefully we can uh, start that process today. We're gonna be mostly talking about poem and stone fruits in today's presentation. Um, poem fruits, we'll, we'll go over this many times, but poem fruits are our apples and our pears. Um, stone fruits are our nectarines and our peaches. It tends to be uh, the most uh, um, uh, common fruit trees that we hear people uh, trying to maintain here in the Salt Lake Valley area. So we'll spend most of our time um, on those. And then again, I'll give you some other resources for, for some other types of uh, fruit trees as well. I also just have, uh, and I'll put this at the end as well, um, if you have questions, gardening questions for us throughout the growing season, we answer a lot of them through the Salt Lake County office. And um, that is the email there that you can send those questions to. We uh, always appreciate uh, some pictures that come with our questions so that we're not just reading descriptions of what somebody thinks is the problem with something, but rather we can have a chance to kind of take a look at it ourselves close-ups and the far backs, um, whatever it's going on. And we will do our very best to help guide you in uh, determining what it is that's maybe not going well or that you don't need to be concerned about or whatever may, might be happening um, in your yard and garden. So that's the email there that we answer those questions through mastergardener at usu.edu. Um, as Sean mentioned, this is one of those classes I get a lot of questions from people about their own particular backyard fruit trees. Um, and uh, what I might want to try to do is to leave those questions um, for the end. I'm more than happy to spend some time with you answering those questions. Um, but I know that there are some people on today's presentation that just kind of want the pruning information and then maybe they have some other things they need to get to today. So I want to make sure we get through the content. Um, but just please realize that we will have time for those uh, kind of individual backyard fruit tree questions as well at the end. I might just save it for that time though for that reason. Okay, let's get started. Um, this is our first audience interaction. I want to know what's your goal today. So maybe in chat, you would be so kind if you have a particular goal. I had a few ideas of some of the goals that people might have. So while you're uh, inputting those into chat, I kind of thought, well, maybe some people's goals are that they want to learn how to prune for uh, optimal fruit production. Um, maybe people are uh, wanting to figure out how to do a little bit of size reduction or height maintenance in their fruit trees. 
um, that they might be thinking about uh, pruning for ease of care. So I love these people. These are the thinker headers. These are the ones that are saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to get into those trees and thin them, and I'm going to have to do pest management. I'm going to have to harvest the fruit. And so I need to make sure that I'm uh, pruning structurally so that I'm able to do those things with ease. Um, maybe some people think that they're uh, wanting to learn about pruning to, to control the growth of the tree. Or just because they have a fruit tree in their backyard, they think, gosh, it's necessary for me to prune because that's what we do. We prune fruit trees. So let's see. I want to just see if I can get in there. Okay. Yep. All right. Good. All right. Those are some good comments there. Ooh, I like that. Answering questions for others. Production and tree health. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to start off for just a minute um, to say that when you prune, you're actually not controlling growth. Okay, and, and that's probably the, the biggest misconception we have to get out of the way right, right in the beginning. When you're pruning, you're actually stimulating growth. Um, and so we prune so that we can get the structure of the form that's desired and that the new growth that comes on the tree that following season is that in a desirable direction in a way in which we want the tree to grow, okay? So we'll go over some of those uh, kind of pruning tips here in a little bit, but just realize every time you make a pruning cut, you're not taking away from the tree. You are literally taking away from the tree, but you're also stimulating new growth. And so that tree is going to respond to that pruning cut. And so that's what we just have to be a little bit uh, knowledgeable about so that we know how to correctly do that process. Um, not everybody is worried about optimal fruit production. Um, we here, especially in the Valley, have access to great quality fruit. Um, we have farmers markets, some of our uh, grocery stores, and, you know, and some of those uh, uh, corner stands and markets are filled with wonderful quality fruit, and so we have access to it. Um, but uh, pruning is, that really is kind of the main purpose of pruning fruit trees is, and it's kind of from an orchard kind of a standpoint or, you know, perspective is that you're trying to have optimal fruit production. So optimal production and, uh, and very, very high fruit quality. Okay, so that's really one of the main reasons for pruning. So if that's not something that's terribly important to you, <laughs> then pruning may not be something that you want to take on. Um, pruning for size reduction or height maintenance. Absolutely. So we have a lot of care that happens with fruit trees. We like to be able to do that care or that maintenance on those trees more within arm's reach at base level than, uh, you know, 15 or 20 feet up in the air. And so uh, we're, we're starting the pruning of those trees very early in their life so that we can uh, have that, uh, that structure and that size that's going to make that tree manageable um, over time. Um, I have a, a little bit of a quiz question for you, if you could pop it into chat. Um, when should you start pruning a fruit tree? So pop that into chat, and I'm going to look at those while we kind of keep going here, and then we'll come back and we'll revisit that. So when should you start pruning? A fruit tree. When in its life should you start pruning a fruit tree? Okay, pruning for ease of care. And so, like we said, um, you know, there's a lot of maintenance that happens um, in the tree or tree canopy. So, having that be a little bit more accessible um, is really important. Uh, pruning to control growth, we already talked about that, that you don't prune to control growth, you stimulate growth through pruning cuts, but that we're uh, stimulating growth to go in desired directions. Uh, we want the tree to respond the way we want it to and not just how it might otherwise. And pruning because it's a fruit tree and we think it's necessary, you don't have to prune fruit trees. In fact, you probably will have a longer lived fruit tree in your landscape if you aren't doing a lot of intensive pruning on it. Um, we're not pruning to maintain the, the tree health over time. We're pruning for optimal fruit production, okay? So if you have a tree that you think is just a really beautiful shape and form, it provides you great shade, um, and it's doing really well, there's absolutely no reason why you necessarily need to prune that tree. Um, it is just an option if that's something that you're, you're, what you're desiring through the fruit production, okay? You probably will have lower quality fruit, poor quality fruit. You probably will have pest-ridden fruit, 
in uh, an unmaintained, unpruned fruit tree. But if that's not really anything that is uh, concerning to you, then there's no reason why you, why you have to prune it. Okay, going back to my question really quickly, I asked uh, in the life of the tree, when should you start pruning a fruit tree? Uh, the answer to that question is the day you plant it. <laughs> um, you're right, there is an optimal time of year and we'll talk about all those things. And so maybe we'll say the year that you plant it but you start pruning very, very, very early in the life of the tree because the genetics of the tree wants it to grow a different way than we ultimately want to have it uh, have its form in the landscape for fruit production purposes. So we start that process very, very early, and then we just sort of do maintenance pruning from year to year thereafter as, as the tree matures in the landscape. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Okay, there are some climactic factors that are beyond our control. Um, for example, if there's a really early bloom time, uh, we can have uh, frost damage to those blooms, those fruit blooms. Um, this is, uh, we all know this is true in apricots in particular. They're uh, you know, one of our very first fruit trees to, to bloom in the landscape, and especially people that live in areas um, that are at high risk of having late spring frosts. Um, you may only get apricots every two, three, even four, five, six years, depending on where you live. Summer heat is a, an issue for us sometimes. So certain types of uh, fruit varieties um, might have poor flavor or color if it's excessively hot. Certainly we saw a lot of summer heat this past year in the Valley. Gala, Gala and Honeycrisp are a couple examples of those. Uh, wind damage can be an issue for us. And wind damage is actually worsened with, uh, with uh, heat and cold as well. So if it's if it's really cold and it's windy or if it's really hot and it's windy, we can see uh, a lot of heat damage, heat stress in fruit trees. Freeze-free days. Um, so for example, late season apples like Granny Smith or Fuji won't ripen in some areas if there aren't enough freeze-free days for them to, uh, to finish their maturation. So these are fairly late blooming apple varieties. And so for certain areas, they may not be suitable. So I encourage everybody, um, if you go to this website, and please do get out a pen and paper, because I'm going to give you a bunch of references here. And so you're going to want to be able to jot these things down to, to kind of have them handy. But we have a really nice website here, climate.usu.edu, um, where you can pull up uh, weather data for your local weather station. It's going to give you, um, you know, the, the average length of your of your growing season between your average last frost and your first fall frost. Some of those really important pieces of information that are going to help you to make some good decisions and have a better understanding of um, what's happening uh, locally. We do have quite a bit of variation within the valley, and this this probably isn't a surprise to people. Even where you live within the within the valley, for example, um, our historic orchards are kind of up along the foothills. Uh, cold air tends to drain down to the valley floor, and so you have a little bit uh, less uh, cold that happens on those foothills. And of course, as we climb on our elevations, we have uh, th those impacts as well in terms of our climate and our temperatures. And so again, that website is going to help you know where you are, uh, what you can expect locally. All right, let me see if I can get back here. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, really, really important when it comes to fruit production. And really, this is this is what we're trying to accomplish <laughs> when we prune, is we want to let in the light, okay? And we don't want to just let in light to parts of the tree. We want to let in light to the entire canopy of the tree. So fruit trees require a lot of light. They require 8 to 12 hours of direct sun daily for good fruit production. And actually about 30% of sunlight penetration needs to hit the fruiting wood for there to be fruit blooms that are produced. So we're very concerned about getting light into the entire canopy of the tree. And, and frankly, that's why we're making the pruning decisions that we are. So we don't have branches or portions of the tree that are shading uh, other portions of the canopy and not letting light in. So we prune to maximize the light penetration throughout the canopy of the tree. So some growing factors um, that are somewhat within our control are things like microclimates. Uh, we talked a little about elevation that low-lying areas are more at risk of spring frost. So people that are uh, live really close to the Jordan River, <laughs> the closer you are to the Jordan River in the valley, the lower line you are. 
Um, you might want to select later flowering species um, that, that's going to help you a little bit in terms of uh, trying to mitigate your risk against uh, uh, frost damage in the spring. Exposure, so south exposure, so uh, south facing areas um, tend to warm up a little sooner in the spring. Um, and the west exposure, we actually get longer growing seasons with that exposure, um, but, it, but it's a little bit higher risk of mid-season heat. Uh, proximity to lakes and mountains. Um, and so, you know, our look at our historic orchards and a lot of times their body, they're uh, in uh, neighboring areas of, of water bodies because in the winter time that water holds some heat that helps to keep that adjacent area just a little bit warmer. In the summertime, the, the water holds uh, coolness that helps to keep the adjacent area just a little bit cooler. So it kind of helps to moderate those temperature fluctuations. I put mountains as well because especially here in the valley, um, they can have a, a, a big impact depending on where you're oriented. I think in particular, I don't know if there's anybody here that's up against Mount Olympus, um, but you are quite a bit colder, quite a bit longer <laughs> into the spring <laughs> months just from the shading effect that's happening um, where you are situated uh, next to that mountain, if you're oriented just right um, in some of those types of neighborhoods. So sometimes those can have impacts as well. Um, and uh, just kind of an idea here is that um, if you are at risk of a late frost and you're worried about that and you're noticing that your trees are starting um, to, to bud out and starting to bloom, and I'll actually give you a resource where you can monitor how uh, worried you should be about that here in just a second. But you can protect, protect those early flower buds from early frost damage by throwing a tarp or blanket um, over those trees. Another really fun idea that um, I like to I like to think about is putting incandescent holiday lights. So not the LEDs, but the ones that do get off a little bit of heat. And so I like to say you get to show off your your pruning prowess spring, summer, fall, and on into the winter months because your neighbors can admire what a wonderful fruit tree pruner you are based on your beautifully lit fruit trees that are also helping you to moderate uh, that temperature right around <laughs> the, those fruit buds um, or those flower buds uh, when we're moving out of the winter months. Um, and so that's just an idea as well. I told you I would give you a resource. Um, we have a really great um, fact sheet. I'm gonna be referring to a lot of these different resources. I highly suggest that you utilize them. Um, I will hold it up. Um, hopefully you can see it. Uh, maybe I can put it in chat at the end too. That's probably not great, so I'll read it to you. Um, it's called Critical Temperatures for Frost Damage on Fruit Trees. So if you just did Critical Temperatures for Frost Damage, USU. So critical temperatures for frost damage, USU. What's really cool about this fact sheet is it will show you at the different stages of bud development, uh, when you can expect to have about 10% bud kill and 90% bud kill based on temperature, okay? So for example, when apples are first coming out of dormancy, their buds are first starting to swell, that, uh, that bud stage is called silver tip. You're gonna lose about 10% of those flower buds at about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to lose about 90% of, percent of them at um, 2 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can help. You can look at those buds, say, okay, here's the, the stage that they're in. This is what is predicted temperature-wise in terms of the low. It's going to help you make good choices about whether or not you need to go out and try to protect those buds. Um, those are really uh, great for kind of these the late frost spring frost kind of choices that, that tend to pop up with us with fruit trees. It does go over apple, pear. Um, it also goes over apricot, cherry, nectarine, and plum as well. So a lot of different types of fruit. It's a really great resource. Okay, soil conditions are somewhat within our control. Uh, fruit trees like a well-drained soil. Um, don't get thrown off by the technical term loam. Loam is just kind of an ideal combination of sand, silt, and clay for gardening purposes. Um, but the, the soils do like quite a bit of organic matter. Um, and so our soils naturally here in Utah tend to be fairly low <laughs> in organic matter. It's probably not shocking uh, to most of you. Um, and so with fruit production, we typically would recommend sort of preparing a site and doing some addition of that organic matter. Um, so, you know, something like uh, uh, organic matter incorporated down to about six inches. Um, usually for new sites, we say about two to four inches of a well-composted organic matter. 
and then you can do smaller annual additions an inch or less over time. But if you can get that incorporated in about a year before you plant, um, that's really um, ideal. Fruit trees, fruit production uh, does uh, best in a soil pH between 6 and 7.5. Good thing is that's um, not terribly out of range of what we typically see here in the valley. Um, our soil pHs that come back through soil testing, I would say range about um, typically 7.2 to about 7.6 or so is what I most commonly see. So we're, we're within that range. It's very difficult to alter soil pH um, with our soil chemistries and our irrigation water. Um, and so uh, we typically don't recommend uh, trying to uh, lower the soil pH, but rather just kind of um, working with types of fruit that do well in our in, in growing in our in our soil pHs, our natural soil pHs. Um, this is a big one here. Soil salinity. Um, fruit is not terribly tolerant of a lot of soluble salts in the soil. Um, usually for basic landscapes, we recommend um, that you do, you have a, a, a salinity re reading of uh, two to four decisiemens per meter or lower, but it's even lower for fruit. And so most fruit trees, um, you need about 1.7 ECE or decisiemens per meter or lower uh, before you start seeing some impact on fruit production. Cherries are actually even a little bit less than that. So I would just say watch your soluble salts. Definitely didn't want, don't probably want to put fruit trees next to, you know, sidewalks or driveways that you're adding a lot of de-icing salts. Um, you know, careful in terms of organic matter additions, not overdoing it, especially if you're uh, incorporating a lot of um, animal manures and things like that. Um, not overdoing it in terms of um, added fertilizers in the landscape, because those are those are some of the ways in which those soluble salts can creep up. Um, I'll answer questions on salts and soil at the end, if that's okay. Um, we do have some nice resources. You can access uh, most of these at usual.usu.edu down on the bottom and just look under the soil testing tab. And there's all kinds of resources there in terms of soil salinity, soil testing, all those different sorts of things. Um, but since that's not really a focus, it's important, but it's not the focus, um, probably leave more of that discussion towards the end if people still have some questions. Um, and then also, you know, if you're amending your soil, you might as well be managing your weeds too, especially your perennial weeds and, um, and getting those areas ready to put your fruit trees in. Okay, so soil, um, just really quickly, is a combination of sand, silt, and clay, which is weathered rock and materials, air, water, and organic matter, which are things like plant roots, macro, microorganisms, um, humus, which is decomposing organic matter within the soil. And a good and ideal soil by volume is going to be about 25% air, 25% water. So from an irrigation standpoint, and this is really true for garden soils, this is true for turf, <laughs> this is turf, true for trees, even beyond fruit trees, this is true for compost piles, really. Um, ideal uh, so, uh, water volume in soil is um, going to feel like a wrung out sponge, okay? So if you completely submerge a, smu a sponge in water, you pull it out, it's saturated, it's dripping water out, you wring it out and you put it in your hand and there you can feel that there's definitely water in that sponge, but there's air in that sponge as well. And that's really the level in which is perfect for, um, for garden soils and for soils with fruit trees growing. So people have a tendency to overwater their soils, right? Or overwater their landscape plants. They add too much water too frequently. Well, when you do that, which fraction are you dipping into? you're dipping into that air fraction. And plants in general, and fruit trees for sure as well, need really good gas diffusion around the root systems. And so it actually, uh, it, it, it makes it so that it's a less favorable growing environment for those plants. So you wanna make sure you don't overwater. You, you water enough, um, but that you allow enough air in that soil as well for the gas diffusion around the root systems. Okay, um, so we add organic matter, which helps to uh, bring about uh, biological activity within the soil environment, which is very important. So we have all of our fungus and bacteria and all these different sorts of things, macro microorganisms, that along with sand, silt, and clay, these guys are coming in, they're feeding off of these organic matter, 
additions, these amendments, and um, they're helping to glue or bind these sand, silt, and clay particles together into what we call aggregates. This is what we call soil structure formation. And when we have this aggregation, that is where we have the macropore space that allows water and air to be able to uh, take up space within that soil environment. You see this sometimes in a really good garden soil where uh, if you pull up the soil, it comes up as kind of like this almost pea-sized um, sort of, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, structure or whatever. That's, that's an aggregate. That's a, a, a sign that you have really good soil structure formation in the soil. Okay, moving on. Water is entirely or maybe entirely, <laughs> depending on the circumstances within our control. Um, fruit trees use a lot of water. Um, seasonal water use by fruit trees is as much as 50% more than properly irrigated turf. Now, I didn't say overly irrigated turf. I said properly <laughs> irrigated turf. But fruit trees do take a lot of water. And uh, drought in fruit trees um, are, is going to cause some problems for you. They're not going to produce consistent crops. They're going to have poor fruit size and quality. Um, and then also, I just put that your irrigation water source is also um, a factor. Uh, culinary or city or treated water versus secondary sources. Some of our secondary sources are really high in soluble salts, depending on where they're coming from. So that is a way, another way in which we can have salinity levels creeping up in soils and impacting the fruit production. We recommend deep and frequent irrigation of established trees um, and uh, that you uh, are going to irrigate a little bit more frequently for newly planted trees, one to two times a week, probably, depending on your soils. Sometimes people who have really sandy soils need to water a little bit more frequently. Um, but you don't have as large of a root system with these newly planted trees, so you do need to do a little bit more frequent irrigation just to make sure that they are getting adequate water. So you watch them until they mature and develop a more extensive root system to become established, and then you can skip over to that deep, infrequent irrigation of, of of the trees. This is just a picture of an orchard. This is obviously a very high intensity production orchard. Um, you can see that they're training these trees up um, so that they can uh, do a very close sort of planting. Um, this is something we probably wouldn't recommend, obviously, for a backyard garden. But um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but I think you can kind of see in the picture that the, the drip irrigation line is running um, down at the base of the trees. Um, and I have this picture because I just want to make uh, the point in saying that here you have your, your grass pathway in the middle, but the, the area in which is right underneath the trees is cleared of vegetation. And this is really quite common in orchard type settings. Um, grass, or sorry, trees actually don't compete. And this is actually a sort of a general statement. They don't compete very well for, for water with grass. Grass is what we call a very fibrous root system. It, it, it really is very competitive for water. And so I hear this, probably the most common thing I hear um, from folks that they say, well, I, I, I water uh, my, my grass and I'm just assuming my trees are, are getting water from that too. And that's not necessarily a safe as assumption. Um, it's best if you can have a cleared area under the tree in a backyard garden setting, a mulching or something like that would be ideal. And that you do have uh, drip tubing if you're doing drip or, or the water access um, is uh, making its way to that area that's cleared so that you're ensured, at least in that zone, that the tree is getting the water and the grass kind of isn't getting to it first, okay? Um, so that's just maybe one consideration as you think about irrigating. Um, just because your grass is getting adequate hydration, um, you know, you may actually have some drought stress happening in your trees if you're not doing those deep irrigation, um, infrequent irrigation events specifically for those trees. Um, another really important consideration is, is root stock, especially for apples. Um, and so uh, a standard root stock, which is really doesn't have any dwarfing um, properties, uh, you can expect a tree that's going to get to be about 40 feet tall. A semi-dwarf root stock um, is going to yield a tree that's about 50 to 80 percent the size of the standard tree. A dwarfing root stock is 10 to 25 percent of the size of the tree. Um, and I'm not going to go into depth with root stocks here, um, but there are great resources that give you a lot more information about this. Um, and also knowledgeable, um, you know, Reputable nurseries should have some, um, some good information on this as well as when you're shopping for your trees. But this apple production and variety recommendations is a great 
um, uh, publication that we have. Um, also, uh, garden.usu.edu, we have a whole section on apples or peaches or, you know, whatever, grapes or whatever it is that you're trying to grow. So I recommend looking that up. And I also put another site here, extension.usu.edu forward slash box elder. Uh, Mike Pace up in Box Elder County has um, some uh, expertise in fruit production. He works a lot with the Fruit Heights growers up in Box Elder County. And um, he has his own listing of uh, varieties that he recommends. Um, so you could use that as additional information with some of these other resources as well if you're shopping for what, what would work uh, best for me. And frankly, if you have really technical fruit growing questions too, he, he's a really great resource up there just because he is so knowledgeable in fruit production. Um, so to me, just the takeaway here, you know, it depends on the rootstock and it's, and it's most so for apples, but a dwarf tree can get to be anywhere from, you know, up to six, eight to 10 feet tall. A semi-dwarf tree, you're looking at somewhere between 15 to 25 feet tall. And a standard, you're looking from, you know, 25 on up to, uh, well, 40 feet tall is, is possible. So these can be really quite large plants. And so you want to take root stocks seriously uh, because they can help you with, with, the, with the size maintenance over time. So this is just kind of a, that the root stocks are all in relevance with one another. Okay. Okay. So flowering and fruit set. Flower production is a, a two-year cycle. Okay, flower buds form in the spring and summer and continue development into the fall. Uh, flower buds bloom and produce fruit the following or second year. And fruit maturation and flower development are happening simultaneously in the canopy. So when we're talking about getting light penetration into all the, the portions, all the areas, all the parts of the canopy, we're not just talking about that for fruit coloration and fruit development. We're also talking about that because we want to make sure we have light penetrating the fruiting wood. So we have flower bud production that starts to occur in the spring and summer and, and through the fall so that next year we have good fruit production as well. Okay, so I just kind of want to make that point. And uh, you will need to learn to recognize where fruit is produced. Um, we Fruit is produced on something called, let's look at these here in a minute, on fruiting spurs on pome fruits. So again, those are apples and pears and one year old wood on stone fruits, which is would be like your peaches and your nectarines. Apricots are actually produced on um, spurs as are uh, cherries, as are um, plums as well. We'll look at some of these here in a minute. So I'm not gonna leave you on this. I promise we'll, we'll kind of cycle back, okay? So this is what a spur looks like. It, it looks like a stem that's been condensed I think it almost looks like a, an accordion, um, like it's been smushed together. Uh, and these are really quite old. It takes about two to four years for these to uh, be produced on trees to the point where they're producing um, fruit blooms and, and, and fruit buds, okay? So you wanna make sure that you recognize these and that you don't prune these off, okay? Because this is where your fruit is gonna be formed on apple and pear trees. Peaches are formed, the, the fruit buds are formed on one year old wood. So the wood grows the previous year, it produces these fruit buds, and then it's that second year that they actually produce the, 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 that the buds bloom and produce the fruit for you. And we'll look at another close up picture of a peach um, bud here in a minute so you can see exactly where the fruit is formed. Cherries kind of form in these like kind of world like structures. So cherries produce on two-year-old wood, okay, and then um, uh, plums and apricots um, uh, produce fruit on spurs as well. So really peaches and nectarines are the ones that are, are, are really different. Now with um, apple and pear, it takes quite a while for those fruiting spurs to develop. And so it, like I said, it takes about um, two to four years before a spur is gonna start fruiting for you. So if you have a newer tree and you haven't figured out why it hasn't started producing fruit for you, that might be part of the reason why those fruiting spurs are, they're, they're still, de still developing, excuse me. All right. So successfully pollinated flowers um, uh, transition to fruit set. 
Um, some fruit trees are self fruitful, while others require cross pollination with a compatible variety. Um, so, for example, apples are this way where uh, you need to have 2 different varieties of apples to cross pollinate to have fruit production and the compatible varieties are going to be varieties that are in bloom at the same time. Okay, um, there are uh, pollination charts that are available um, that show you what those compatible varieties are. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that today because I do want to spend more on pruning itself. But just to give you an idea here, um, apple trees require uh, cross pollination. Pear trees, Anjou and Bartlett are partially self fruitful, but cross pollination will improve cropping. Apricot, most are self fruitful. Um, Perfection, Ryland, and Rival require cross pollination. Peaches and nectarines, most are self fruitful, but JH Hale is not. Plums, um, so some prune types like Stanley and Damson are self fruitful. Others require or do better with cross pollination. European plums require other European varieties as cross pollinators, as is the case with Japanese plums as well. Tart cherries, our most common one is called Montmorcery. It is self fruitful. And sweet cherry, uh, Stella and Lampins are self fruitful. Bing Lambert and Royal Anne require a, a, a cross pollinator. So that's just a consideration as well. Fortunately, um, so when I say cross pollinator, it needs to be of a different variety. So you can't have a gala apple um, pollinating a gala apple. Okay, it needs to be a different type of apple that's in bloom at the same time. Bees, uh, which are some of our primary pollinators, do travel quite some distance. So oftentimes a neighboring tree will be a cross pollinator tree. Um, my understanding is they could travel up to miles. And so if you're in a, an urban area, chances are you're gonna be okay. Also, fortunately, some of our ornamental apples and pears, like our ornamental crab apples or ornamental pears, um, it can be an effective um, pollinator for um, apples and pears as well. Um, I also want to just mention that thinning is important as a consideration. Um, perhaps some of you have been in a situation where um, you've noticed that you have apple or pear trees that have a really heavy crop one year, and then the next year you get hardly anything. You get you get like no crop whatsoever, and then you return back to having a heavy crop that third year. That's called alternate year bearing. And uh, basically what's happening is that you have, with that heavy crop um, and with the lack of thinning, that you have a lot of seed formation. And when, um, when those apples and pears, they mature seed within the fruit, it sends a hormone to the plant to say, I had really good uh, fruit set, I had really good seed set this year. So I think that I can probably back off needing to uh, fruit as much next year because there's lots of viable seed in the ground. And so chances are there's gonna be a new apple tree or a new pear tree that's gonna be able to germinate based off of the seed that I dropped. So uh, thinning is your solution to that. And we'll talk about thinning here, I think just in the next slide. But with thinning, you do it when the fruit is still really quite small, so quarter sized. It's before those, uh, those uh, seeds begin to mature and before that hormone is sent back to the tree telling it that uh, it needs to back off next year in terms of fruit set, okay? So lack of thinning results in smaller, lower quality fruits. Also, oftentimes when we have fruit that's touching one another, like if we have a we have twins <laughs> or triplets on a fruiting spur, and that fruit is touching, that's a great place for insects to get in um, to the fruit. And so you do want to thin. That's another reason why pruning is going to help you because you're going to be doing that thinning more kind of face level or within arm's reach and not uh, way up in the air. I don't want anybody on ladders or climbing trees <laughs> to try to thin or pick fruit. Let's let's keep that closer to the ground where it's a little safer and more accessible. Okay, Give one second here, there we go. So thinning, as I mentioned, thinning is best done when the fruit's about quarter sized. Um, you remove the smaller size fruit, if you do have a situation where you have like, for example, two fruit too close together or two or three fruit or whatever on a, on a uh, fruiting spur, you would want to leave the largest size fruit of those and take off the other ones, okay? Peaches and nectarines, um, you want your fruit to be about six to eight inches apart. You can see this picture here. This, uh, this uh, gardener is using their hand to kind of space out those peaches, okay? 
apples and pears, you leave fruit six to eight inches apart. And we talked about leaving the larger of the apple if you have twins or triplets on fruiting spurs. Apricots, plums, and cherries are usually not uh, thin, okay? Although you certainly could like with, with plums and stuff. And you wanna use a little bit of um, kind of logical, rational thinking here and that we know that fruit is very, very heavy. And another reason for thinning, I, th I find a, a lot of um, fruit growers, they, they don't want it thin, right? They want, they want all the fruit on the tree. They don't wanna take any of it off. But you really should. Um, you are going to get larger, higher quality fruit. Um, also, you have to just think about how heavy that fruit is. And if you're not thinning, um, you're more prone to having branch breakage and things like that. And that really stinks when you have a great scaffold that's oriented the perfect direction. It's really productive for you and you just left too much fruit and it, it breaks off for you because you lose that whole scaffold. So that's another reason why you want to consider thinning. All right, I am not going to spend time on pests, <laughs> um, but do realize that if you grow it, they will find it and they will come. And you may get one or two years of a tree being isolated enough that they don't find it, but they will. So we think of apples and pears, collie moth, fire blight actually is a, a, a disease. It's very important to be knowledgeable for apple and pear production um, for, you know, other things. Um, the, the greater peach tree borer, peach twig borer, um, the uh, western uh, cherry fruit fly maggot um, are some of the pests that you can expect in fruit production. We have a great site, utahpest.usu.edu. Um, there are pest advisories that are available to sign up through those that will give you timing on these sorts of things. Um, and uh, they will have great pictures and help you recognize of the different types of fruit, what you can expect to be seen in terms of pest control. Um, fruit production is high maintenance, it really is. And so the, the site does give you both organic and conventional pest control options. There are those available for these different types of pests, but you do really need to be actively managing pests or you're not going to end up with high quality fruit. Uh, fruit production does not end with pruning and thinning and harvesting, unfortunately. Um, you also have to manage and maintain those pest control programs. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, this is a resource through that site. And I, again, I hate the, it's probably not the, the best, but this is a fact sheet for um, peach and nectarine pests. It's gonna go over, it's gonna show you what they are. Unfortunately, they're different for the different types of fruit. So if you have a peach tree, you need to know what you're looking for in peach trees. If you have apple tree, you need to know for that. If you have plum tree, you need to know for that. They're, the, the fruit that are, are related to one another are gonna share some of those same insect and disease pest pressures, um, but they're all different. <laughs> so you have to really, depending on what you're trying to grow, you have to educate yourself on what it is that you're looking for and how to best manage it. That manage those over time. Sure. Utahpest.usu.edu. I can't say enough about that site. It's a phenomenal site. It's a nationally renowned site. We are so lucky to have it here in Utah. We really are. Okay, so we're gonna delve into pruning specifically now. Um, and one of the first things I wanna say is um, don't be scared, Ninja Warrior. <laughs> um, pruning is very intimidating to people in the very in, in the beginning, um, at least most people. Some people seem to not worry about it too much, but you're probably gonna do, you know, unless you're not planning on pruning your tree at all, you're probably gonna do more harm than you, <laughs> than you do good by not pruning. And so you're gonna make a few mistakes pruning and it's okay. The trees really frankly are going to, for the most part, forgive you, okay? Um, the other thing is, is that there's, there's no one perfect pruning cut decision. Um, you can make lots of decisions. You just try to make the best decisions possible. So, you know, give yourself a break, get out there, do it. If you do make a mistake, then chances are you'll be able to correct that over time. Um, it's just sort of something you sort of need to just delve into and, and, and don't, don't, don't be scared of it, okay? And, and I'll try to walk you through some of the pitfalls of things that you, you really want to avoid. Um, in terms of timing, we usually do prune uh, most fruit trees during the dormant period. Um, 
However, you want to do this after the coldest part of winter has passed. So, for example, this uh, this cold plunge, um, cold air would have been tough if you had pruned right before it that we just we just experienced. It takes um, fruit trees about two weeks to seal off or compartmentalize that that wound that's created from that pruning cut. So we typically do prune um, towards the the latter part of the winter. Um, so that we're out of those those coldest days, okay? So, you know, early March-ish, although, you know, it, there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability, obviously, but, you know, watch the weather, and if we do have a, a cold period coming up and you have some options in terms of when you prune, you might want to hold off and wait for that cold weather to pass. And one reason why we do uh, prune during the dormant period is, and I mean dormant period and that there, there aren't leaves or flowers, or swollen buds on the trees, um, is there's less risk of disease. It's easier to visualize the tree, which is important in terms of your pruning decisions. And um, like we said before, these dormant cuts are gonna stimulate new spring growth in the trees, okay? Um, we do sometimes do some summer pruning um, in particular for our stone fruits. So um, peaches and nectarines. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is we're, we're increasing sometimes air circulation if we have growth that's happening in the interior of the canopy. We're getting that out of there for shading, um, increased air circulation. It can also help for increased um, fruit color uh, for, uh, for those developing peaches and nectarines. There is a higher disease risk in pruning in the summer months. And so we really wanna focus most of our pruning during the dormant period. Um, I had a hand up, I'm wondering if it's a, the, the right timing. Um, so early March is kind of when uh, when we're kind of starting to get out of our, our coldest um, winter days, but really pruning can happen early March through March on into early April, um, depending on the year. So you do have a little bit of a window of time there, um, but that's kind of when we first start talking about pruning fruit trees. All right, some tools, some pruning tools. Um, I love that my colleague, Sheridan Hansen, who has a background in fruit production, she always starts with the hands and the hands are really important because as we're out in our landscape, especially in the summer months, um, you're gonna start to see growth that's developing within the tree. You're gonna, and we'll go over these terms here in a minute, but you're gonna see uh, water sprouts. You're gonna see suckers, things like that. And you can pinch those off with your fingers and pinching them off with your fingers is such a, easier and less time intensive and frankly uh, easier on the tree than coming in with a pair of hand shearers and, and pruning them off the following year. So picking off those kinds of unwanted growth, unwanted pests with our hands is a great way that we can kind of be doing pruning uh, throughout the growing season and not just during the dormant period. Hand pruners. Um, Good pair of hand pruners is a really important pruning tool. We recommend the bypass pruners with those bypass blades, not anvil pruners that have a crushing effect. And so your, your pruning branches up to one half inch in diameter. Are really important to keep these clean, keep them sharp. So a little bit of maintenance on these. Invest in a good pair of hand pruners and then take care of them, keep them clean, sharpen them up and, and they'll uh, be great for you for, for many, many years, okay? If we need to be pruning slightly larger size branches, uh, loppers, again, we recommend a bypass blade on these. These are gonna take branches up to about an inch and a half in diameter. Um, and it's also a great way for some of us that are uh, vertically um, <laughs> uh, uh, not, uh, not as uh, gifted, I, I don't have a better word for it, sorry, um, that we can get a little bit of a height advantage you know, without having to get up into the tree, without having to um, climb a ladder. My favorite um, probably is a pruning saw. I use pruning saws a lot. Um, these are for grant branches greater than an inch and a half in diameter. Um, now pruning saws are very, very difficult to sharpen. And so this is one of those where you could probably buy the less expensive pruning saw, frankly, and just toss it when it's kind of gotten dulled and, and go ahead and buy a new one. Um, but you know, you, you can sharpen them. They just, they take quite a bit of, quite a bit of effort. Um, curved blades are sometimes nice on these and you get a really nice kind of push and pull. Um, so it can help you with your efficiency and your pruning. Um, and, um, I like to, you know, I have a, another colleague that says that he uses the, the three S, uh, rule where if you're struggling, 
you're sweating and you're swearing, you're probably using the wrong tool. You need to upgrade, okay? So look at the size of that branch and engage what's the most appropriate tool based on that. Chainsaws are really only appropriate for one type of pruning cut, which is a single pruning cut to the base of the tree. And I would say if you need to use a chainsaw <laughs> to prune your fruit tree, you probably should question why you're making those cuts, okay? So that's not really something that you're using um, for your, your fruit tree pruning. I should just say too, and I know we're all adults, but you know, don't get in over your head, right? If you're at a point where you're taking off limbs that are large enough for maybe warranting using a chainsaw, get a professional involved, have a certified arborist come um, because it, it's one of those things where you, it, you know, tree wood is very, very heavy um, and uh, you just don't want to be in a situation where you're potentially getting hurt or causing a lot of ripping or tearing within that tree by making poor decisions that way. Okay, so if our first priority for pruning is that we want to remove any problems that we have in the tree. So prune out any diseased, broken, or damaged branches. Also remove anything that is crossing or is going to become a crossing branch that could potentially rub against other branches. You will have to make a decision about which branch of those two rubbing branches or crossing branches that you want to remove, okay? Um, or those that have a narrow crotch angle. And so you can see this is an example. When we say narrow crotch angle, this is a 45 degree angle. We really don't want anything that is 45 degrees or less. And actually, this is really a nice picture because you can see on the kind of right at the base, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you see um, the crotch here has this included bark, which is looks like this puckering bark that's coming up. That is actually where the, uh, the, the trunk or the main stem and the branch um, uh, tissues are not uh, really joining together very well. It's a natural point of weakness, and that's where we're going to tend to see a lot of ripping and tearing. Okay, so we do want to see a uh, branch angle more like, oops, sorry about that, more like something like this. So a 45 to 90 degree angle is a stronger angle, and that's what it is that we would prefer to see, especially for fruit production since fruit, fruit is so heavy in the tree. Okay, now there are ways that you can try to guide trees early in their life and so while these branches are still uh, quite young and flexible you can use kind of a weight down system like this where um, uh, you're you're uh, using a string and some sort of a heavy object to try to bring that branch angle uh, closer to that uh, between that range of 45 and 90 or maybe a heavy gauge wire this is not left on very long, okay? You are taking this off uh, probably after a single growing season, but, but it is a way that you can kind of help to guide that uh, branch angle while those stems are still flexible. Now, obviously, these, these branches get too big and they build their rigidity and, and you, can't, uh, you can't do this anymore. That is why this structural development happens very early in the life of the fruit tree. <laughs> we don't wait. <laughs> for the tree to grow up before we start to try to do this. We, we start this very early. Um, you can use shims, okay? And you can use construction shims for this as well, okay, to help to do this. Or um, uh, the clothespins can work as well is another option, okay? And again, you're not leaving these on very long, uh, maybe for like a growing season, but you're just developing those early crotch angles so that they have that, that strength to them. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna move my window so I can see. All right, here we go. So um, our second priority for pruning is to establish and maintain the tree's shape through selective thinning cuts. I'll show you what a thinning cut here is in a minute. Uh, we talked about how branch angles should be uh, actually greater than a 45. 45 is kind of the minimal. Um, anywhere uh, above 45 is, is optimal. Um, upright branches, this is really important. Um, water sprouts, I'll show you what these are here in a minute, um, or maybe you know, but upright growth, a lot of people call it suckering in the canopy of the tree. Actually, if it's in the canopy, it's called a water sprout. Um, but those tend to produce vegetative growth only. They only leaf out. They don't fruit, and they also shade the interior canopy of the tree. So they are unwanted typically in, in fruit trees, okay? Horizontal branches below the horizon, so more than a 90 degree angle, typically are shaded and they're too weak to be uh, productive. So uh, those are not optimal either. Oops, sorry. 
So some ease, some really early and easy pr uh, pruning decisions here we have before. So there's some branches here in red. Maybe you can put in chat uh, the reasons why we're deciding to prune these branches away. How about these ones here at the base? Anybody know what these are called here at the base? A little quiz, put it in chat. Suckers, yeah, good. So those are called suckers. So if they're coming from the base of the tree or the root system, they're called suckers. So those are not doing anything for us. In fact, usually suckers are, uh, the vast majority of fruit trees are grafted. So suckers are your rootstock. And so they're a different type of, uh, for example, if say this is an apple tree, they're a different type of apple than your above ground growth. So there's no reason why you would wanna leave suckers. You get a lot of suckering, especially in mature apple trees. Um, it, it actually is quite, and that's that's natural, it, it's quite the chore to remove all of those, but you really should attempt to remove all of those. So we don't want suckers at all. Okay, tell me in chat what's happening here. Why this next branch up in the tree? Why are we, are we removing that? Damage, great, broken, right. So there's no point in leaving that. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. Now let's move up a little further. We have these branches here that have this upright growth. What are these called in the canopy of the tree? We just talked about that. Water sprouts, great. And so those are gonna be vegetative growth. They're gonna shade the interior uh, canopy of the tree. We, we get a lot of this actually in tree fruits, especially older trees. And so there's no reason to leave water sprouts. We always go ahead and take those out, okay? And then how about over here? We have some of these branches here. What's going on over here? Weak crossing, excellent. So maybe the branch angle is too weak. Um, they might be crossing. We see a lot of upright kind of vertical growth. And so those are some really easy pruning decisions. Those are things, those are the very first things we want to remove. And then we can stand back and we can take a better look at the tree and make decisions from there. So just some really quick, quick terminology here. Of course, we all know the trunk of the tree. Scaffolds are these main branches. We're, we're typically selecting scaffolds, these main limbs for the ones that we want to leave on the tree for fruit production. Branches, oops, sorry, come after the scaffolds. Okay, so they're kind of these outward growth here. Uh, we have a stub here. And so this is an improper pruning cut where we sort of leave this stub. We don't want to leave a stub like that. I'll show you what a proper pruning cut looks like in a minute. So that would be something that we would want to take off as well. Our water sprouts, again, are this uh, growth here. This sort of what we think of as suckering in the canopy of the tree. We call it water sprout suckers at the base. And then the central leader, and the central leader becomes important because when we talk about in a second um, apples and pears, we're going to talk about modified central leader. Uh, we take off this tip. And so this was a tipped uh, central leader. Um, the up uh, right growth would have been had apical dominance um, in terms of, of, of growth suppression in, in the lower part of the tree. And um, and so we're, we're choosing to remove that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But central leader, we kind of talk about this trunk portion, this, this upright growth, the top growth um, towards the top of the tree. And then we're going to move into talking about um, heading cuts and thinning cuts next. Okay, so when we make a cut, um, we want to make sure that we're making a cut in a branch um, that is right outside of what we call the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. And actually we had a good picture of that back here when we were looking at the crotch angle. So you can see that there's kind of, this is this has some included bark, but you can see that there's kind of this natural swelling. If I were to remo remove this branch, I would do it outside of this uh, branch collar and branch ridge, kind of this, this uh, area in which we have stem, and uh, trunk tissue that is uh, trying to uh, transition with one another. What we don't want to do is a nice sort of flush cut. Um, that's problematic um, because it makes it very difficult for that tree to compartmentalize off that damage and to kind of um, seal over that damage. The outside is, is, is the natural place that we make that cut. Let me go back to this picture here. Okay, so we're making this cut kind of on a diagonal outside of this zone. If you are uh, taking off a larger size limb, this is very important. We do something called the three cut system. Our first cut is down below here. We go about a third of the way um, from below through that branch. The second cut we're making is outside of that first cut. 
And this is all the way through the branch. And the reason why we do this is we're relieving the weight, okay? Now, if we make that second cut and we start to get some ripping or tearing that occurs, that ripping or tearing is gonna stop at this first cut. It's not gonna move down into the trunk of the tree and, and cause considerable damage to the trunk of that tree. And then that third cut, we can be, be very precise because we're not dealing with a lot of weight. Um, we can make that third cut outside of that branch ridge and that branch collar. Okay, so a thinning cut is used to remove a stem or branch back to another major branch, okay? So you're going all the way back to another branch. And uh, this is uh, important because thin branches do not, um, they don't grow back. So new growth, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but you can see the tips here are green. So the previous year, uh, a pruner came along and they did some thinning cuts where they took these branches back to these, uh, these junctions of these more major branches. And so what we don't see is new growth happening where we made this pruning cut or just below it but rather the, the growth response in the plant is going to be to put new growth at the, the tip of the uh, remaining branches that are there. So new growth occurs at the tips of the remaining branches. We thin outside the branch collar, or if you're doing, frankly, just like uh, shrubs and landscape, you can do thinning cuts down to the base of the plant as well. Um, and it gives a more natural looking result. Uh, we do a lot of thinning cuts like in apples and pears, okay? Um, now, a heading cut is different. A heading cut is where we remove the tip. So think about like if you were hedging, okay? If you were using head shears and you were hedging a hedge, you're just sort of taking off the tip. Um, sorry about that. It removes the tip of the branch. Um, usually if we're making a heading cut though, um, we are doing it at the bud, okay? So here's the bud. This is a dormant or latent bud, okay? And we make this cut right above the bud, kind of in the direction that the bud is facing. And the response is gonna be that this bud is going to break dormancy and it's gonna start growing in that uh, direction, okay? So that's the growth response uh, with a thinning cut. But what we do typically see is it may not just be that bud, it might be others as well. When you do these heading cuts, you get a, kind of a, a flush of growth that happens just below the point of the cut. Um, so we don't typically use heading cuts for um, palm fruits. We do sometimes use them for stone fruits, but I'm kind of curious if you can put in chat why you think we probably don't use it for, for palm fruit, fruits. Thinking about the fact that when you make that heading cut, you're sending out the growth response is gonna be a flush of growth. So put that in chat and then um, I'm gonna keep going here and we'll come back to, to what it is that you, what you have to say about that. Um, so heading cuts result in fuller, bushier growth. So think of like a, a hedge pruning um, and uh, the heading of large branches. Yeah, good, yeah. Okay, um, so the heading of large branches, sometimes we refer to this is uh, like tree topping um, is not recommended under any circumstance. It's really, really bad arbor care. You don't do size reduction through um, heading cuts. It's You get very weak branch angles. Um, you get a lot of upright growth. It's very, very um, stressful for the tree. Um, basically, the tree goes into survival mode and sends out a lot of these um, water sprouts up in the canopy of the tree. So we would never recommend that. Um, if you need to do size reduction, you would wanna do it as, as a thinning cut, okay? And not a heading cut. Um, okay, so that was, uh, I definitely saw some uh, really good responses there. Thank you for putting those in chat. So yeah, what you don't want is you don't want a flush of vegetative growth at, right below that heading cut, a lot of water sprouting taking place because you are going to get shedding, or, or sorry, shading, you're going to have um, sh uh, the um, weak branch angles that result. And so that's why we really want to avoid doing um, a lot of heading cuts and poem fruits like apples and pears. Now we do do them in stone fruits though, um, peaches and nectarines. And the reason why we do them in stone fruits is because we actually take the, the tips of the branches of the fruiting wood that are remaining and we head them back to a bud. And we do that because we want to increase the strength of that fruiting wood so that as those peaches and nectarines develop on it, um, those branches can actually hold them up. And so you're, you're reducing with heading cuts, you're reducing those, uh, that fruiting wood down to a diameter of somewhere around about uh, pencil width, 
okay, so that it has enough strength. I'll show you a little bit uh, better, I, I hope, visual of this here in a minute, um, but we do do that, but really only with stone fruits. We do very minimal heading cuts with uh, poem fruits, apples, and pears. We, we mostly choose to do thinning cuts with those, okay? So, <clears throat> I don't know why that popped up like that. That's okay, though. So, that top picture is, we talked about that earlier, is, is, a, is a spur for apples, um, pears, and um, apricots, and uh, plums as well. Spurs are small thorn-like shoots where fruit is born. Um, spurs take about two to four years to, de to develop, um, and so you want to just be careful not to prune those off. Peaches and nectarines have a triple bud arrangement, uh, which consists of two fruiting buds towards the outside, that's where the peaches are formed, and an inner leaf bud. Okay, that kind of uh, that straddles between those two um, those two fruit buds on the outside. I'm sorry, give me one second. Oh, and then uh, buds for uh, for peaches and nectarines form on one year old woods, so they're forming um, from previous year fruit wood growth. Okay. So really, oops, sorry, really important. I actually just there we go, perfect. Sorry, I just put this presentation together uh, for this year's my first time using it. So there's a few quirks I need to work out, but I appreciate your patience. Okay, so um, we already kind of talked about this, but it's really important that you have good light energy reaching all the portions of the canopy of the tree. Um, without pruning, you'd have about uh, 60 to 100% full sun in that upper portion, um, 30 to 60% kind of in that mid portion, and 0 to 30% in that lower portion. And remember, you need about 30% uh, light energy uh, to uh, be reaching the uh, fruiting wood for there to be uh, uh for there to be flower and fruit development. So we're, we're, we're pruning these trees to increase the light penetration throughout the canopy of the tree. So you really can kind of stand back and look at it and, and look at all the different portions of the tree and say, can light get into the middle of the tree? Is it enough light? We talk about the soccer ball test where can you kick a soccer ball through the uh, scaffolds that you're selecting for fruit production. If you're not a soccer player or not talented in soccer, then maybe a, a Frisbee or a ninja kick, right? That really is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to accomplish through our pruning. Okay, and so we want light energy to the, to the, the upper portion of the tree, but then also to the middle and lower portion of the tree as well. You can see some distance between those primary scaffolds. That's gonna help us to do that, correct? So that's some of the decisions that we're making. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of our prioritization and I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna teach you a little bit about forms and then uh, that's gonna kind of wrap us up today. So we're, we're getting there, I promise. Okay, so priority three, space wood to allow for adequate light penetration, evaluate branch density, our branch is evenly spaced around and up and down the tree. Can you kick a soccer ball between the scaffolds without hitting the branches? Can light penetrate into the interior parts of the tree? Okay. I'll slow down a little bit, but here's where we're getting to form, okay? Poem fruits, apples and pears, you will hear some differences of opinion. I would say, for the most part, cherries as well, although you can prune cherries to an open base center if you want, okay? That's your choice. Um, but certainly for apples and pears, we do something called modified central leader. Modified central leader, we select two to four main scaffolds starting at about hip or knee height. Now, it doesn't have to be hip or knee height. That's typically what they would do in an orchard. But you want to keep those first set of scaffolds fairly low to the ground because that means that the tree that you're trying to maintain, the tree that you're trying to access, is going to be more at face level, arm level, um, than if it starts higher up, okay? So fair, fairly low to the ground. You do have to think about like if you're trying to maintain underneath the tree, give it enough distance that you can still do that. So there is, you know, some preference there, but, but more or less you're talking about at knee or height level. That first set of scaffolds are going to be uh, more or less whirled around the trunk. It is good if there is a little bit of vertical distance between the scaffold heights, but you can see kind of like here, we have a, a lower scaffold here, and then the other side just slightly raised from this other uh, lower scaffold. We have another one here. Now, these scaffolds should be exploring different uh, portion of the uh, surrounding area, okay? So we don't want 
scaffold shading scaffolds. They should be growing, they should be generating out different orientations um, from the trunk so they're not shading one another. Now, this isn't the greatest picture, but let's just pretend like this was a, or maybe we don't have this middle set of scaffolds. We were just, we decided to take them out, but you have your first set of scaffolds down below, and then you have about two to three feet in between, and then you select a second set of scaffolds, okay? Um, of three to four main scaffolds. Um, actually, like I said, with this picture, I probably would take out these if they were me. And so I'd have my lower scaffolds and then I'd have my, uh, my upper set of scaffolds. Um, but kind of the same idea in that they're allowing that second set of scaffolds to explore different areas um, that they're, they're coming out from different areas of that main trunk. So they're exploring different uh, spaces of the surrounding area. We don't want scaffolds shading scaffolds, okay? Once you have selected your primary scaffolds, now it is time to remove your central leader. So you remember our central leader is here. We're taking that off. That's gonna help us with size control. It's also gonna help us to not have vertical growth growing up that's shading um, the, the scaffolds um, underneath, okay? So more or less, that is the uh, modified central leader. This was a little illustration from IFA. Go IFA. I thought this was great. They did a really good job of sort of breaking this down where you can see three to four scaffold branches and our first sort of set of scaffolds close to the ground. Make sure that we have our correct branch angle, okay? So that we have nice, strong uh, scaffolds here that can hold up the weight of the fruit, okay? Now we have some distance between those lower scaffolds. We have a second set of scaffolds here that again are oriented out different directions so we don't have scaffolds, shade scaffolds. Here's our soccer ball test or a Frisbee test, right? You can kick a soccer ball in between these sets of scaffolds. And then once we have that desired or desired scaffolds in place, then we are going to, well, they, they went ahead and they did a third one here, but we go ahead and we take off that central leader, okay? Um, so that uh, we are maintaining that height and selecting for those, those main scaffolds. The only difference between modified central leader and central leader is just with central leader, you, you would actually leave that top growth. With modified central leader, you're taking off the tip of that central leader. So over time, you're looking at something kind of like this. It's hard to see because you have leaves and blooms. This is why you prune during the dormant season. Um, but fairly low to the ground, you have your main scaffolds, you have correct branch angles, um, you have some distance, and then you have your second set of scaffolds, and then you take off that central leader at the top. Okay, um, stone fruits, peaches, nectarines, you can try to do this with apricots. Apricots tend to get away from us. Um, they are really difficult to sort of maintain. <laughs> the structure and height over time, um, but you can do this with apricots. Um, this is an open uh, vase center. I actually do this with plums too, although I see um, people sometimes recommend the modified central leader. So I think you could do either, um, I, it, but anyway. So uh, this is open vase center. If some of you uh, prune hybrid tea roses, you're gonna be somewhat familiar with this where you're almost kind of creating like a bowl shape so the center is open and your main scaffolds are all towards the exterior, okay? Almost forming like a bowl, like a pot, if you were doing pottery. So you select three to four main scaffolds starting at about near waist, whirled around the trunk. You select scaffolds that form a vase-like shape with some vertical difference between the scaffold height is ideal, okay? Ident and, and then, uh, these are what the ones that you select for. And um, with peaches and nectarines, um, you will get, you'll be able to recognize visually that year old wood because it, it's got an orange color to it. It's really pretty, actually. It's got a really pretty coloration. And when you're uh, pruning these to maintain these trees, you prune away about 50%. You, you prune the heck <laughs> out of peach and nectarine trees. You prune away about 50% of the fruiting wood every year. Again, you just wanna make sure you're getting lots of nice light penetration into the center of the tree. So our first decision obviously is if I have any center uh, growth coming up through the center, then that's 
uh, fruiting wood that we want to prune away because we want to make sure we have really good light exposure down into the tree. So prune away about 50% of the fruiting wood. Of the remaining fruiting wood, you're going to do that heading cut. Remember, you're going to cut that back um, to about uh, a third to increase the, uh, the, the fruiting wood strength, okay, the branch strength. And again, something around the, the, the range of about pencil sized, so it's strong enough to hold up those peaches and those nectarines, okay? So again, this was my IFA. I thought they did a nice job, open base. So we're gonna start to select our three to four primary scaffolds fairly close to the ground, okay? And again, they kind of come up in this vase type kind of shape to them. Um, so they're all exploring different spaces of the surrounding area. And then once we have uh, selected our main scaffolds, we are going to remove that center to maintain that base shape. And then over time, this is kind of what it is that you're looking like, okay, with a mature peach tree. Okay, that was a lot. I am gonna get to q and I can go back in slides. Um, but let's go ahead and wrap it up for those of us that, uh, those of you, sorry, <laughs> that would like to go ahead and, and move on. I found, a, I, I just Googled garden guru and this guy popped up. I think he's out of Australia. Uh, and so I'm sorry that I'm not nearly as, as charming and <laughs> enthusiastic as this guy. <laughs> he looks very knowledgeable and very fun to talk to. Um, but I thought I would uh, give you a few uh, uh ending words of wisdom and first to say, don't be scared. Um, you probably will make a few mistakes. It's okay um, that you're learning and your fruit trees will forgive you and your neighbors will forgive you and I will forgive you and it's not a problem. Don't be scared, get out there, uh, do your best and you will learn through practice over time. Um, don't get in over your head. If it's too big of a task, um, ask a professional to come help you, okay? Um, so that you're not uh, putting yourself in a dangerous situation. You're not causing a lot of uh, uh, tearing and harm to the tree over time. And never prune in pairs. I'm very glad that pruning um, comes after Valentine's Day. Uh, pruning is not a date night activity. Um, you will have many decisions when it comes to pruning and two pruners will not ever, ever come to the same conclusion about what is the, the perfect appropriate way to prune. So you pick a tree, whoever it is you're pruning with picks a tree. You guys don't uh, challenge each other in your pruning decisions, uh, just stick to your own tree. And I think that that will uh, hopefully mean that everybody leaves uh, happy and, 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 and able to continue to, to learn over time, so. Okay, um, these are just some resources that I, um, that I mentioned, you may want to jot these down, the garden.usu.edu. We have lots of information on uh, fruit growing fact sheets, a lot of detailed information on pruning different types of fruits, fruit.usu.edu. We also have a publication called Pruning the Orchard um, that you can utilize as well. That will be helpful, utahpest.usu.edu. Extension.usu.edu slash Fox Elder was Mike Pace's site. He has some recommendations um, for fruit tree cultivars and fruit information, our soil testing site. And then if you want to send us information, mastergardener at usu.edu. So hopefully that was somewhat clear. I'm more than happy to take whatever questions you may have if you need. Thanks, Katie. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, fruit trees are something that I'm not super familiar with, but uh, they are definitely a challenge, uh, but it's good to see the results at the end of a growing season when you got some good fruit to eat. So um, let's see, we have about 10 minutes or so. Uh, if you have questions, you can throw them in the Q&A box. Uh, that's probably the best way for us to keep track of them for the next few minutes or so. There's one on here. I don't know if you talked about this specifically. What is the difference between modified central leader and topping? Yeah, so the modified central leader, it's it's just the recommended form for apples and pears. Um, a big difference between modified central leader and topping is that 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 you're right, you're doing kind of that top cut, but you're taking it down to a, a major scaffold. So in essence, you're doing a thinning cut, where um, with topping a tree, you're just you're doing a uh, heading cut. 
So you're you're not being very uh, selective in terms of where you're making that cut. You're just kind of making it wherever you make it. Um, and so that you have a different growth response based on those on those decisions. So, uh, you. you know, topping isn't something that we typically do in fruit trees. Um, but I mention it because it's just it. I see it a lot around the valley, and and it's just it's it's really bad tree care practices. So frankly, you know, don't top your trees for size reduction. If anybody asks you if they can top your trees for you, tell them thank you, but no. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's not recommended. So uh, let's see. Are there any resources out there uh, for nut trees, Katie, uh, with USU Extension? Yeah, it, we have a, a section on nut trees um, in uh, pruning the orchard. Um, so I would recommend that. It does go through different types of nuts. I should have recommended too, for those of you that are still on, uh, we have a couple of really, really nice YouTube videos too. Um, one is pruning apple trees. If you just do an, an online search, USU pruning apple trees, and another one is, um, uh, pruning peach trees, but you'll get that that kind of step by step, and they're really short. I think they're only like three or five minutes, um, but they kind of go through step by step and give you a little bit better. I know it's hard sometimes over line, but um, online, but uh, it, it will kind of show you those pruning decisions. Um, but yes, we do have a publication called Pruning the Orchard um, that covers. In fact, I have it right here. It covers uh, walnut and pecan. Um, see if it covers any of the other nuts. And then if you have any other sort of uh, specific questions, then you can let us know. Nut trees get big, <laughs> <laughs> like really big. Um, so I don't know if the goal is to have the tree. You can have a nut tree and um, it can produce nuts for you and you're not really necessarily trying to, to prune it for, um, structure. I mean, you can still have that. Um, you're just not necessarily going to be able to do that harvesting and stuff right at, at face level, but nut trees in general are, are they, genetically, they want to be very, very large trees. <laughs> so um, that, that maybe is just a consideration before you make that decision to put one in the landscape. Yeah, unless you have a big yard, I would maybe lean towards something else. Growing yeah, something. you know, apricots are the same way. They're really hard to keep up with. Um, in terms of size control and they, they just get big. So gotcha. but they can be great trees for the landscape, provide great shade and, and you still get the benefit of, you know, the nut production or the apricot production. It just isn't necessarily right at face level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, will water sprouts eventually grow fruit? No, okay. um, not likely. And so, yeah, that you really don't want to leave water sprouts. Water sprouts, um, and the other reason why you don't want to leave water sprouts is because they're, they have very weak branch angles. So they're going to be very susceptible to breaking or tearing. So um, water sprouts, are, that's a definite take them out. Gotcha. Um, here's an interesting question. It's referring to those like five in one, like stone fruit uh -huh. that you can buy. Um, do you have any advice for a plant like that? Have you uh, taken care of one of those five in one varieties before, Katie? Um, I have. Another um, example of that is, for example, sometimes you get espalier trees, people purchase mm -hmm. espalier trees. And what's happening is um, at each of those main scaffolds, it, there's a graft union right there. So they're grafting those different types of fruit onto, um, you can think of common root stock. They're grafting it onto the trunk instead of just having the graft union closer to right above the ground. Um, my, my advice to that would be, I mean, treat it a little bit the same way where you just, you know, want really good sort of um, separation between the, the, the different scaffolds. But one of my main uh, pieces of advice is to really protect <laughs> those graft unions on those five and one trees, because if, if it tears off the trunk, you've lost it and you're not going to get it back. Um, so you do really want to, you know, make sure that you're not uh, have, you don't have too much weight on that branch. If it needs to be supported somehow that you're doing that so that it's not ripping off on you. That craft union is a little bit of a point of weakness. I'm not going to lie. Um, so you might want to just give a little bit more consideration of that, of like the five-in-ones or the spoliers. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. 
Sean? No, no, not a ton. I don't have a lot of experience with uh, like the five in one or anything like that. I have limited experience with the SBALIA pruning. Um, we have some at the garden, uh, but I don't know. It was just kind of an experiment for us and they look OK. <laughs> We're yeah. definitely not experts on how to prune them. There is a question about SBALIA. It says, yeah. Uh, how do I encourage spurs to form on or near the main branches with an espalier uh, apple tree? You just really need to make sure espalier, um, that, that's an example of one where you, you really probably do need to still do some summer pruning <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're so, in, you, they're so intensive to maintain that form um, that they will try to, to push out of that form. You know, the, the tree, hormonally wants to grow up <laughs> it doesn't want to grow out like that and so you do get a lot of that sort of upward growth that takes place so i don't know that i would uh look at it necessarily as encouraging spur formation um although i will say this you need to keep up with the pruning and you remember that you're not going to get uh you're not going to get uh fruit bloom and fruit bud development on uh, fruiting wood that doesn't have good sun exposure. So if it's constantly shaded, then you're probably not going to get spur development there. So really keeping up with that pruning so you have a lot of light penetration to the the, the, the portions of the espalier, of the scaffolds on the espalier that you would like to have spur development, maybe would be my best recommendation. Yeah, one, one thing I've learned is the espalier is definitely a lot of work. And it's a long-term commitment. I mean, we planted uh, apple whips probably five years ago, just teeny little things, and slowly started to train them to the, the trellis that we're having it grow on. And last year was the first year we got fruit, five yeah. years later. So, yeah, it's a long-term commitment before you even get any fruit. So They are beautiful, though, and they're, they're great if you have, like, a fence sign or something to mm -hmm. take advantage of that. Yeah. yeah, they're a, a great way to um, have fruit without taking up a bunch of room either, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Maybe one or two more questions here. There's someone that's asking about a pear tree, a younger pear tree, that the central leader was broken off due to wind damage. Um, what would be the approach with that tree going forward, do you think, Katie? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard without seeing the tree, like where that break happened. <laughs> um, you know, you, uh, will have some, you, I mean, one thing I, I could definitely say, and this is true really for any sort of, um, damage, because it, it does occur sometimes, is you can kind of do a wait and see, and you can see, uh, where, how that tree responds in the following year in terms of if it's trying to push out, uh, new scaffolds that are in a desirable direction or things like that. And so you might need to just kind of evaluate where you see the new growth happening, whether or not it's it's a situation where it's going to be satisfactory in terms of um, over time, um, you know, having that, that desirable shape and form. That is tough. Um, your other decision could be if it is a young tree, and I know this, this hurts a little bit, but um, you could just decide to take it out and put a new one in because really you do want to start early in the life of the tree getting that <laughs> ideal form and structure so that uh as the tree matures you know you have that um going for you moving forward but yeah it's a little hard to hard to say without actually seeing it so yeah. sorry about that yeah that would be an example of something if you want to email us pictures of it to as a question then we could maybe take a look at it and could give you some advice you know, though, the thing is, is that I think people put so much emphasis on pruning fruit trees. And I mean, you really, if if, if it's still a, a desirable tree for you and you still like the look of it, you can continue to grow that tree. There's there's nothing saying it's got to be perfect form and structure for you to keep that tree. Um, you, it, It's kind of up to you. It's your decision, what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, there's, I guess, questions about other types of fruit like berries. Uh, are there resources yeah. on USU Extension's website yes. for berries? Yeah, we have some great videos. Um, you know, yeah, and I knew that that would come up. And and it, there's just not time, unfortunately, to cover <laughs> tree fruit and 
small fruit, but we, we have some great publications. We have some uh, great videos that walk people through how to prune those as well.